A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. The Iowa caucuses are just days away. We talk with the leaders of Iowa's Republican and Democratic parties. Are the February 3rd caucuses really worth your time? We ask that question on the cities. It's touted as the first in the nation test of presidential candidates, but the Iowa caucuses are actually held every two years. They are party functions that only entered the national stage in the 1970s, particularly in 1976 when they helped launch Governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter, to the White House. Right now, the Iowa caucuses loom large over the 2020 election calendar, but how many of you will really participate? And joining us are the leaders of the Iowa Democratic and Republican Party, Democratic Party Chairman Troy Price, who hails from Durant, and Republican Party Chairman Jeff Kaufman, who lives just 10 minutes away in Wilton. <laughs> a band of brothers almost. <laughs> 10 minutes is a stretch. Both of us from Cedar County. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Cedar County and I guess Northern Muscatine County are well represented here. I used to be able to run it in 10 minutes, but not anymore. That's not happening anymore. But let's talk about other, <laughs> let's talk about other running and other races. Uh, who should show up? Because the rules are very clear for the Democratic caucus, Republican as well. Mm -hmm. But but you got to be there by seven. You got to be there by seven o'clock. But we would uh, we encourage everyone to come to our caucuses. You know, if you want to see a change in the White House, if you're interested in some new leadership in Washington, come to the Democratic Party caucuses on February third. Just make sure you're in line by seven o'clock. You can same day register right there at the at your caucus site, uh, and we will have plenty of registration forms this year. And so we encourage folks to come uh, and participate in this uh, great expression of democracy because once again you have to be a registered Democrat or a registered Republican mm -hmm. registered independent does not count no no you have to be 18 as of when as of election day this year so uh, first new time new uh, this cycle but yeah as long as you're 18 by uh, November 3rd of this year you can uh, participate in either one of our caucuses right. and let's talk about the Republican caucus I mean you, you have to ask the question why would you even show up it's kind of uh, we already know what's going to happen well it's a party building exercise as you had mentioned and so we're counting on on Republicans being there to build out organization, to be ready for the November uh, cycle and what's going to happen in the summer and the fall. And I strongly believe, and in fact, I think this probably is the number one reason why Iowans should show up, specifically Iowa uh, Republican uh, Party members, and that is we need to show the rest of the country that on this day, both Republicans and Democrats deserve this honor of first in the mm -hmm. nation. Both of our parties are dedicated, we're working together, and to be real honest with you, regardless of the party affiliation, our voters can handle this honor. They take mm -hmm. it serious, and we can't. And from the Republican Party, we can't take a, a cycle. Uh, we can't take a cycle off. The other big difference between the Republican and the Democratic caucuses is the Republicans is almost like a vote. It's a little sheet of paper. You, you get uh, speeches that are made to you. Mm -hmm. Little sheet of paper. You vote. Democrats are very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, how we do it is folks uh, come into the room. They, uh, it's, the way to think about our process is that it is a uh, ranked choice process with two choices. And so uh, you come in, you stand in your corner, we count how many people are in the room. If you're in a, vi a group that has reached uh, what we call a viability threshold, to uh, basically the threshold that ensures that you get delegates out of that night. If uh, you reach that threshold, uh, usually 15%, then you're good to go. If not, then if your candidate has not, then you uh, are still a free agent in the room and you get to go to your second choice. And then once it's all said and done, we uh, report all those numbers up, including the uh, what we call state delegate equivalents. That's really our measure to see to how national delegates are going to break down. Uh, and we combine that all statewide and we figure out who our delegates are going to be to Milwaukee. Uh, so it's a gr it's a but the thing that makes our process so much fun is that in that moment when those folks are uh, uh, after the first alignment period is that's when you just see neighbors having conversations. You see neighbors talking about how uh, who should lead our party, what issues are important, what do you care about, why don't you come to our side because we can, uh, we represent you. It's really a great expression of uh, grassroots democracy and it's a lot of fun. Well and they also talk about retail 
politics, mm -hmm. and that's only happening seemingly in the first four states when you think about it. Yep. You, you think of uh, uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of important to keeping Iowa first in the nation, is that you now have that cluster of four, so you have a little more uh, racial uh, mm -hmm. diversity there? Yeah, each state is, comes from a different region of the country, and each state represents uh, in different you know, voices, different uh, challenges, but the thing, that, uh, the thing that makes Iowa so unique, and the reason why Iowa should remain first, is that by the very nature of our caucus process, you can't just show up in Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, hold a big rally. You can't just put a bunch of money on TV. You have to actually go into communities. You have to go in and talk to uh, urban communities. You have to go in and talk to rural communities. You have to go talk to the African American community, the Latino community, the, Nat uh, the Native American community, the Asian American community, and so many other different groups. You have to go and actually talk to them. Candidates can't just fly in and fly out. They have to build organization in all 1,678 precincts. That's how you win in Iowa and that's why when candidates come out of here they're stronger they're better they're sharper and they're ready to fight for the general election and we're certainly seeing that now but four years ago that wasn't necessarily the, necessarily the case I mean uh, a Donald Trump was holding huge rallies, really pointing out, look at all the people showing up, as opposed to going to a person's house or, or, or much smaller events. And it worked for him. It did, but the Trump campaign learned a very important lesson. The Trump campaign, remember in 2016, finished second. Right. And the primary reason why he finished second to Ted Cruz was the organizational ability of the Cruz campaign. I really believe that the Trump campaign learned that even Donald Trump and his rallies was not going to be able to vault him into first unless he had the ground game, unless he had that interaction. That's why even though there's not a whole lot of competition right now, the Trump campaign is very much organized. I've got oh, probably 30 or 40 Trump organizers for a caucus without a whole lot of competition because he learned a lesson in 2016 that you cannot just fly in and fly out in Iowa. You've got to interact. Well, let's talk about a history lesson real quick because in that particular caucus, Ted Cruz, as you said, 27.6%, Donald Trump 24.3%, Marco Rubio very strong 23.1%. But did Iowa really change the uh, meter as far as Republicans were concerned because you know, Ted Cruz lasted a little longer, Marco Rubio didn't last a whole lot longer. But you know what I'm saying is that was Iowa really an indicator for Republicans four years ago? No, and I, I don't think Iowa's supposed to be an indicator. Iowa is the first step in a process, the first step to interact, the first step to own the speech, the first step to showing that you're presidential medal. There, you won't find uh, a single Republican that is in a position of responsibility, I don't think on either side, correct me if I'm wrong, Troy, that will tell you that Iowa was supposed to pick the next mm -hmm. president. The other thing I would add to that, though, is this whole idea about diversity. Yes, having four carve-out states gives us diversity, but the three that you just listed, two Cuban Americans, Barack Obama was made by the Iowa caucuses. I believe Iowa in and of itself, although demographically not as diverse, I think our people here, they clearly have proven without a doubt, Republican and Democrat, that they're going to look at the content of one's character, not the color of one's skin. I really believe that Iowa in and of itself can make an opinion that, is, that reflects diversity of ideas and diversity of ethnicity and divert, of the wide array of diversity. And then you add to it the other three carve-out states. I think we have a very, very solid beginning to picking the commander-in-chief in this country. Well, because, Troy, a lot of people say that Iowa's the opposite. It doesn't necessarily pick the winners. It gets rid of the losers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the role that Iowa is supposed to play is winnowing the field. Um, you know, this is part of the reason why Iowa exists is that it's a great place to do this job interview. It's a year-long process. And it's hard to do that in a very large state, you know, where you have to spend a whole bunch of money on TV and you have to spend a whole bunch of money uh, uh, flying around or whatnot. Here, you come in and you go into these homes and you go and you talk to folks. And that's how these candidates get better. And that's how, uh, you know, the people will punch some tickets out of here. We'll see exactly how many come out on mm -hmm. our side this year. We, you know, usually they say three, but, you know, we've got a lot of solid candidates and people are really excited by them. And I think that we'll see what happens on caucus night. But, uh, but I Iowans take, like Jeff said, and I totally agree, uh, Democrat or Republican, we take this role very seriously. We're not afraid to ask those hard questions. We're not afraid to uh, challenge these candidates and their policy positions. And that's why they are better when they come out of here. And that's why they're better, uh, better prepared, uh, not only for the rest of the nomination,
nomination fight, but better prepared to take on uh, uh, Donald Trump in November. We talked about numbers for the Republicans four years ago. The Democrats were amazing. 49.9 percent <laughs> for Hillary Clinton, 49.6 mm -hmm. percent for Bernie Sanders. You have got a tight race this mm -hmm. year as well. What is the, I mean, what do you expect when it comes, and I know you don't want to predict caucuses, but I mean, mm -hmm. you obviously must be predicting a very close race among your top tier. Listen, how we approach this is to make sure we are as prepared as possible, and that's what we have been focused on. And we've made changes this year that will allow, in case there is a close result, and uh, there's some question about uh, the national delegate allocation that comes out on caucus night, we will now have the ability to go back and recount what happens in the room, recreate what happens in the room through what we're calling presidential preference cards, basically, an individual's way to, it's not a ballot, it's an individual's way to mark where they went throughout the course of the evening. And so this is the first time we've ever done it, and it's going to be a great way to uh, create greater transparency in the process. Uh, and so whatever happens on caucus night, happens on caucus night. You can never, I think we can both say, you uh, can never predict what's going to happen on caucus night. But we are prepared for it, and we have been preparing for it for over a year. But you're both chairman with a lot of pressure on your shoulders not to come <laughs> off as hayseeds from the Midwest to the national media, and maybe even in the world media as well. When you mm -hmm. had that close of a race between Sanders and, and Hillary Clinton, the Des Moines Register was calling for a recount. You remember four years earlier from that with Rick Santorum as well um, and, and Mitt Romney where there was a declaration, a, a victory of a few votes, I think 34 I want to say, and then what, 16 days later we were declaring that uh, Mitt Romney actually won. What type of pressure is that for a state chairman to get it right in order to make sure that the other party's gonna be fine as well, that, you, that you're not the one that lost the Iowa caucuses. Well, listen, it always is there. It doesn't matter what happened four years ago or eight years ago. The pressure is always there for us to make sure we get this right. And I can tell you that we have been preparing for that. We've taken a lot of steps this year to make sure that we have the best trainings in place, to make sure we have the room sizes we need, to make sure that if we need to, move a precinct out of its own precinct into a space that's big enough. Uh, making sure that we have enough materials, because one of the challenges we both had was that we ran out of voter registration forms last time. We've got more uh, 100,000. In a way, a nice problem to have. Exactly, but a very nice problem to have. But uh, but we now have 100, I mean, we sent out 100,000 voter registration forms this year. So like, we are taking a lot of steps, stuff that people don't necessarily see because it's all just preparation. But we have been preparing for this for a long time. This has been what we've been laser focused on to make sure that we get it right. And I know that we will. And you still have to get it right, but I bet you you're keeping an eye on what the Democrats do to make sure that they got it right so that you're learning a lesson from them as well. Absolutely, absolutely we learn from each other. Uh, one of the things that we did is uh, we, we got together with experts, our two parties together, mm -hmm. got together with experts from Harvard University about uh, you know making sure that we had everything secure, that we had backups. Mm -hmm. and you know the one thing that they, that they mentioned to us <laughs> is that they had not been in a state where the two parties put aside their differences mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to make sure that this caucus is transparent and this caucus is exactly what we say it will be. That, that's a that's a mm -hmm. yes. We have weight on our shoulder, but we also have we also have some preparedness that we're there for. And I can tell you this much: that you won't find a more transparent process on this globe than the Iowa caucuses. You vote in front of people. You report the results in front of people. There are people already checking the official record while they're still sitting in the caucus, <laughs> going through things. I always tell people if 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 you want a primary or any kind of election to be 100% transparent and foolproof, have a caucus. And that's, that, that's what I really think that we are doing. What, happened, what, what, what has happened in the past, some of those were just individual mistakes, like in our case, the mistake of one poor chair, uh, one poor decision by a chair. On the other hand, I will say this about 2016, and it might sound odd, the Republican chair uh, <laughs> saying this about Democratic chair, but you know, I watched that very closely, and I was on the, I was on the phone with the Democratic chair at that time, and I gotta tell you, I, I was actually impressed with the way that they checked and double check that. That's what they did in 2016. I think mm -hmm. Troy's party and my party, we're, we're ready. We are absolutely ready. I have full faith in the Democrats to carry out their caucus. And, uh, and, 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 I, and the nice thing about this is 
we wish each other good luck yeah, in the process. That's exactly now, right. afterwards, I, 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 you know, <laughs> yes, I wouldn't mind if you stumbled a little bit. No, it, it's a wonderful <laughs> process. It's 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 great to see Iowans come together mm -hmm. around the celebration of transparency and grassroots democracy. So let me end this friendship right now because I <laughs> let's let's be honest. We are now discussing this in the midst of an impeachment trial that is going on in the United States Senate. And let me start with you, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, how big of a factor is impeachment going to play as far as either energizing the Republican base or having people question whether or not uh, uh, Donald Trump is fit for office in 2020? Well, I mean, I, I think it energizes. I, I think it energizes both bases. I mean, I, it, 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 the the impeachment has brought and unified our Republican base together more than I ever could with any kind of a speech or any kind of an investment of dollars into a uh, in, in, into uh, any kind of party building exercises. Um, Republicans are energized. Uh, Republicans see this as a political move. Uh, Republicans, uh, Republicans see this as an attack on the results of a 2016 election. They probably, this impeachment has probably placed us months ahead of what we would have had to have done normally had this not occurred. Well, there's of course politics involved in this. I know mm -hmm. Democrats want to say it's a higher calling and that you're taking it very seriously, the impeachment process, and it's not political, but you have to believe that there is a political aspect in it and deal with it. So first off, what do you think is going to be the impact as far as the general electorate for 2020? Well, I think a couple things. Number one, I mean, our side has already been energized, right? Uh, we have been energized since uh, November 9th of 2016. Uh, but this just further reinforces uh, why we want to see a change in the White House, why there needs to be a change in the White House. The corruption coming out of this administration, the corruption coming out of this president in particular, uh, people are just sick of it at this point. Uh, but I think the other impact of this is, uh, as we saw over the last two days, uh, you know, people are watching this. It's on all three networks. Uh, people are seeing this. And so in some cases, like for those folks who are in the middle, they're actually seeing for the first time just how egregious these actions are, just how dangerous uh, this president has been for democracy and for, quite frankly, uh, you know, the uh, standards by which we have governed ourselves for more than 240 years. And so that is what I think the impact here will be. Um, but for us, listen, we're not approaching this from what's going to be the uh, most advantageous for us. That's not where this is coming from. We are approaching this because, uh, you know, our, our con congressional folks uh, took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And this president has shirked that duty multiple times, and as we have seen here, is abusing his power uh, to, to further his political goals. And so for us, uh, we're going to continue to fight there. Like, whatever the political fallout is, is the political fallout. Um, but for us, we believe standing on the right side of the Constitution, standing on the right side of history, is more important than what the next election is going to be. Any politician knows you've got Republicans, you've got Democrats, you've got to win over that middle, you've got to win over the independents. Does an impeachment uh, trial hurt your chances among independents? Farm Journal, a poll just came out, the president has the highest approval rating. This was before the China trade deal ever recorded. 83% approval rating. That includes not only independents and Republicans, it also includes uh, rural Democrats. I, I think that we are going to be able to show that Alexander Hamilton's worst nightmare came true, and that is when one political party politicizes the impeachment process. Alexander Hamilton warned against that in The Federalist. I'm guessing he's spinning in his grave. Same question to you. I mean, how do you win over the independents when it comes to a, a case of indi a, a case of impeachment? Well, I think when on this, I mean, just look at the facts. I mean, just look at the facts. The president made a phone call uh, uh, or predicated a meeting, an aid uh, to a foreign country, an ally of ours, uh, predicated that on uh, that country uh, opening an investigation into a political rival. That's, that's the facts, that's the facts. And that's not what a president should do. And that is an abuse of their office and that's an abuse of power. And so we're, that's what we are gonna talk about. Um, but it's not just this piece of it. It's everything. It's People are exhausted out there. After three years of this president, people are just tired of having to fight. They're tired of having to see this president uh, being embarrassed every time they turn on the news to see Donald Trump saying whatever the heck he's saying that day that is just outrageous and attacking people and attacking groups and attacking our country. Quite frankly, he's doing so much to divide this. People are just 
tired of it. They're sick and tired of it. Democrats are offering a path forward. They're offering a path back to where we can get back to civility in our government. They're offering a path forward where we can start talking about what this country can do again and not try to pit each other against each other. That's what we're going to be talking about. This is also a historic impeachment because it's happening during the course of an election year and <laughs> in the midst of an election just before the Iowa caucuses where you have U.S. senators <laughs> who happen to be running for yeah. office. What kind of an impact are these hearings going to have for some of those campaigns and do you see the the, uh, the uh, candidates who are not U.S. senators perhaps taking more advantage of that? Well, obviously, I mean, I'm sh assuming that the candidates uh, would like to be, you know, would like more time in the state in the, these next uh, few days before the caucuses. But, you know, they've got really great operations on the ground. They've got really strong surrogates coming through the state. Uh, their supporters are bought in, and they're out there having these conversations all across Iowa right now. So I do think that, uh, uh, I, you know, the impact of it on their campaigns, I don't believe will be all that much. Uh, you know, and we'll just see what happens, I guess, on uh, February 3rd, but I don't think it's going to have that big of an impact overall. Chairman Kaufman, I know that you don't like to quote uh, James Carville very often, but you, <laughs> <laughs> who, of course, was the uh, Clinton strategist in, in 92, but, but everyone has always said it's the economy stupid, or actually the direct quote was economy stupid. Um, is, that what, is that basically what the campaign is for Republicans and for President Trump? Is it all going to be about the economy and, and, and keeping promises? Well, yes, and historic historic levels for African-American unemployment, historic levels for Latino-American unemployment, near historic levels for female unemployment. This economy is booming. People just have to check the, 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 uh, what is going on in, on Wall Street, what's going on with their retirement accounts. We're also not only growing the economy at the upper levels, we're growing the economy at the, at the, uh, at the bottom levels as well. At the, the, the laborers that are, that are, it would be in the lower middle class area, are expanding. Um, we're expanding this at every single level. So yes, it's gonna be that, but you know, the reason why we have 83% approval rating in, in this state among farmers and in the Midwest is the China deal, USMCA. They saw the Democrats playing politics with that. It's gonna be about that. It's gonna be about the Supreme Court. It's gonna be about the economy. It's gonna be about putting America first. Um, it's not going to be about who's the best gentleman, who's the best statesman, because I'm going to tell you this right now, a person that was polite was not going to be able to make the seed change, not only for what the, the entrenched Democrats had done to this country the last eight years, but what the entrenched Republicans had done. So I really believe that it's going to be multifaceted. I got a lot of arrows in the quiver. We're going to take it to them. And uh, for every tweet that might necessarily not set well with a particular independent, I'm going to ask them to look in their wallet. And I think the wallet is going to win. And you've heard that argument before. I mean, an incumbent will always kind of point out what's being done right, especially if the economy is doing well. Mm -hmm. What is the Democratic response to that? The well, Democratic response is people are being left behind. Take a look at where all the money is right now in this uh, in this country and in the state of Iowa. Look at these tax cuts that have been passed over the last few years. All the wealth is going to the very top 1% of this country, and they're just continuing to get richer and richer and richer. Meanwhile, people down who are working, who are uh, struggling to make ends meet, are having to take, do two jobs, three jobs, just to make sure they can put food on the table. That means that those are kids who are not being able to uh, get the, uh, the attention that they need from their parents. Meanwhile, because of those tax cuts, schools are being continually underfunded. Our infrastructure is not getting the resources that they need. And so on issue after issue after issue, Republican policies have made things harder. And let's, I mean, let's also talk about health care for a minute, the issue that everyone cares about here. People are going bankrupt time and again because the uh, they don't have protections through health care in this country. And the Republicans and Donald Trump have continually tried to undermine the Affordable Care Act, which helped provide health insurance for millions of people. They have no plan to back that up at this point. Uh, and so more and more people are falling through the cracks there. We're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about their pocketbook. And we're going to be talking about how much money they're paying out for health care, how much more money that they have to pay out for child care, how much more money they're having to pay out to just get to work every day. That's what we're going to be talking about. And that's why we're going to win. I wonder also, as far as the caucuses are concerned, because I keep mentioning how it impacts the candidates and other candidates. How does it impact the party? Will you be able to get a good assessment of what 2020 will be like after the caucuses, at least as far as whether or not the base is energized or whether or not you're going to get a big outcome as far as a voter turnout? Yeah, I mean, listen, a competitive caucus helps uh, helps parties. That's why we are still a purple state. Uh, you know, when they have competitive caucuses, we uh, uh, we we 
eye them with envy, and I'm assuming that that's a similar case this year. Uh, you know, because we get so many new people in the process, we get so many new voter registrations. We find out uh, we get people who are turning out in places that we don't usually see uh, high numbers of Democrats. I mean, I just saw an event up in Orange City, Iowa, that had 200 uh, 200 plus people at it uh, in Sioux County, Iowa. There's, I think, there's only a thousand registered Democrats in Sioux County, Iowa, and so we're getting. That's what these caucuses do: is that they bring people out, and again, by the very nature of the process, you have to go into those precincts, you have to go into these communities and talk to them directly. It helps bring more energy, it helps grow us from the grassroots up, and that's why I'm confident we're going to win because of the energy that we have in our party right now. So what you see as well, coming up on, on, on caucus day, do you want to see that energized base? I do. I, I'm, you know, I've got very realistic expectations in terms of, of the lack of competition. Competition still drives that. I think looking and, and seeing the fervor that uh, surrounding the Trump rally. Um, but I, you know, we've been seeing this on the ground. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to hundreds, and if you add everything up, of events throughout. And what I hear time and time and time again is, what could we have been doing instead of this impeachment politicizing? We could have been working on drug prices. Um, the governor just just initiated over a hundred million new dollars for education in this state. Um, but everything's being distracted by this this AOC far left. Politi politicalization of, 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 of this, this impeachment folly. And I think ultimately, when you sit down with a, with a rural Democratic farmer, and you sit down with him and you say, do you want a party that's been co-opted by AOC? Do you want a candidate like Bernie Sanders who's talking about giving away literally the farm? Or do you want a president that's delivered on those promises that has record unemployment by min for minorities and has actually proven some actions that is going to actually help Iowa? I got my confidence in those rural Democrats. I think we're going to take more Democratic votes this time than what he did last time in the state. And I will Very just quickly. say this, it's harder to have those conversations because farm bankruptcies have gone up 18% since 2018 as a direct result of this president's policies. So it's harder to have those conversations with the farmers that uh, uh, Jeff's talking about. 83% approval rating. Troy Price. <laughs> Jeff Kaufman. <laughs> Thank you both. You got me both choked up. <laughs> Thanks for no fisticuffs. Thanks for nothing like that. We've been two guys. We needed this. We need, I do we appreciate this. it. We needed to blow out the cobwebs. Yeah. <laughs> well, you uh, want to point out once again that it's important for you to go out and caucus on uh, Caucus Day, which is coming up on uh, February 3rd across the state of Iowa. WQPT has a commitment to military families in the cities. We call it Embracing the Military. And the Rock Island Arsenal's annual MWR Health Fair is coming up next month. More than 70 local businesses and organizations will be on hand to offer health related information and resources. It's what's being called the wellness rocks. Also free items will be given away throughout the day. So mark it on your calendars. It's Wednesday, February 12th from 10 until 2 at the fitness center in building 67 of the Rock Island Arsenal on the air, on the radio, on the web and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.